Traces of ancient stoneworking can be divided into several types. The first have parallels in everyday life, which suggests that they were produced by actions similar to modern ones, but using different tools and methods, since the marks are not identical. The second type, however, does not occur in modern stoneworking. Examples include scoop marks in the Aswan Quarry in Egypt, the Cachicata Quarry in Peru, and the Cerro Capilla Quarry in Bolivia. This may be due to the fact that methods once used in antiquity are no longer applied today, perhaps because of their low efficiency, or because techniques were employed that are now unknown, or even impossible. Impossible not because of lost knowledge, but due to natural circumstances. For example, it has been suggested that Tura limestone was much softer at the time of quarrying and gained strength only once set in masonry, significantly changing its properties. I have not heard any substantiated suggestion that the limestone, more precisely, the micrite, of Sacsayhuaman had similar properties of reduced strength at the time of extraction. Here, many factors must be considered relating to the geological origin and formation of a specific stone but it is clear that lower hardness at the time of construction would have solved many issues. Of course, such an assumption cannot be applied to igneous rocks, andesite, diorite, granite, and rhyolite, which were widely used in Peru. Their hardness was determined at the moment of their formation, which occurred long before construction. And it is precisely the traces on these rocks that I want to focus on now. One such example can be found in a publicly accessible place at Olante Tambo, in the Temple of the Sun. It consists of several T-shaped recesses for clamps on a rhyolite block. These recesses themselves are found across the world, and their use is well understood, although they are not typical for Peru in general. In this video, however, I would like to draw attention not to the recesses for clamps themselves, but to the trace that connects them together. It is remarkable for several reasons. The functional purpose is unclear. Why would it have been necessary to connect two clamp sockets with a groove cut into the stone? And the mechanism of how such elongated grooves were made in stone is also not entirely clear. Not only on this block but in general, even though the supposed tools are well known. It is also worth noting a similar groove on an unfinished sarcophagus in the Cairo Museum. It is quite possible that such traces belong to the same class of features and can be analyzed as a whole. The simplest explanation for why the T-shaped recesses ended up connected to each other is that they may have been made before the surfaces of the block were fully finished. The sequence of work would have looked like this. On a rough, not yet polished surface, the location for the clamps was determined, something that could be done simply by drawing a line with paint. Such layout markings are widely seen on objects from ancient Egypt. Of course, a recess is not always necessary at this stage. But if a flat surface and uniform placement of clamps were required, so that their depth was the same and corresponded well with the adjoining block, there were two ways to solve the problem. Today we would simply fix the level by using the sides as reference and then make the recesses according to the markings. But another approach would be to first level the top side and only then proceed with the work. The task could be simplified further by leveling not the entire surface, but only a narrow strip. This would divide labor and save a great deal of time. Some workers could finish the side surface, using the recess as the reference for the required level, while other craftsmen could work on the recesses themselves from different sides of the block without interfering with each other. If the surface of a block, after grinding, turned out to have the required quality but was slightly higher in level, this could not have been considered a serious flaw, since the next row of blocks would conceal this imperfection. This is exactly what we see on the other side, the groove is covered by polishing. This also confirms that the recess was made first, and the surface leveling came afterward. The very same principle can be observed on the unfinished sarcophagus, where on one side of the groove the surface is polished, while on the other it is rough and sits higher in level. Thus, such elongated recesses were made as layout marks. Let us add a few more examples of similar treatment. One of the better known ones is the upper row of masonry at Coracancha where elongated recesses were cut into andesite blocks. At first glance, it may seem that the task was to remove the upper layer of stone. To do this, a layout groove was first made, just as in the Olente Tambo block, and then the stone was removed in segments. But this raises the question, why was the layout so dense in certain areas? And how was the uniform width of these grooves maintained? If we follow the hypothesis that they were created using rounded stones of hard rock,
often not of local origin but carried from elsewhere, the very type of tools often found at sites where blocks were worked, then parallel grooves should not have been the rule, for several reasons. First, the use of stone hammers inevitably leads to wear, so the hammer's shape would change as the groove was being made. Therefore, its width should have been determined not by the tool's shape, but by a deliberate effort to maintain a consistent width. Or we are left with the rather fantastic assumption that the stone was removed so easily that the grooves turned out uniform by themselves because there was no tool wear. Traces resembling those seen at Korakancha also exist in Japan, on the worked megalith Masuda Iwafune. The stone there is granite, and this highlights one of the peculiarities of this type of trace. They are found only on hard rocks, andesite, granite, diorite, rhyolite. They do not occur on limestone, even though applying such a grid to soft stone would have been most useful, since the material inside the cells could then have been chipped away. Similar to woodworking, where the outline is cut first and the interior removed afterward. On hard stone, however, when working by hand, this approach brings no significant advantage. Moreover, for controlling the depth of the work, vertical grooves would have been sufficient. It is not entirely clear why horizontal grooves were needed, which are also less convenient to make, since blows are easier to deliver from top to bottom than sideways. Another unexplained aspect is the unfinished state of the work. As if a single craftsman had started by making the layout and then, for some reason, never managed to remove the stone. Such a scenario would make sense only if the task could have been completed quickly, within a day, or even just a few hours. Then the next day, circumstances changed, and the work was left incomplete. But in reality, cutting recesses in andesite or granite manually with stone hammers would have required many weeks. A logical workflow would have been for other craftsmen to remove the stone immediately after the grooves were made, that is, synchronously with the layout. But what we see instead is a different sequence of work, along with an excessive grid, as if its creation required only a matter of minutes. This brings us to another observation. What could have prevented the completion of work at the central monument of the Inca Empire over many decades, if not centuries? The same question arises concerning the unfinished diorite masonry of Inca Roca. At practically every site we see traces of suddenly abandoned work, unfinished sections of masonry, half-built walls, or incomplete structures as a whole. But, the mystery does not end there. Where the stone was removed, we see nubs protruding upward, in many cases arranged in the same way as on masonry blocks, paired, closer to the corners. Yet, in this case they cannot be explained as lifting features for handling blocks. The only remaining possibilities are either an aesthetic preference, or the inability to remove the stone at specific points. However, what kind of aesthetic choice could it be if this row of blocks is visible only from above, and cannot be viewed without the construction of an additional viewing platform? Of course, it should be taken into account that Korakancha underwent restoration, especially after the 1950 earthquake. Fortunately, the magazine of the Museum and Archaeological Institute, 1967, includes photographs of this exact section of the wall, with indications of the areas that were subjected to restoration work. As can be seen, most of the upper row of masonry can be considered authentic. Traces of similar layout marks can be seen on several other blocks of the Temple of the Sun at Ollantaytambo. For instance, on a block with a recess running along one side, a clear trace is visible. A similar trace exists on a block located behind the six megaliths, in the form of an elongated recess. Another comparable example is a recess on a block left in preparation at the Cerro Capia Quarry from which the stones for Pumapunku were extracted. There one can see a layout groove similar to what we observe at Korakancha, or on the sarcophagus. Along this groove, additional marks appear at intervals of 26 centimeters, which corresponds to the ancient Egyptian measure of length, the royal cubit. This is a rather strange coincidence. The need for such layout, especially in so crude a form, suggests primitive methods. But why make these additional marks, which would have required many hours of work? They would only make sense if their execution were simple and quick, like drawing with a pencil on paper. The question remains the same, why expend such effort on layout that could just as easily have been made with paint or a scratch? It is evident that the stone was removed not by sawing, but by layered extraction, leaving characteristic traces that can be found at many megalithic construction sites.
In quarries, no traces of saws are ever found. Layout grooves can also be found on the Rodadero outcrop at Saksai Huaman, where a narrow channel runs around a geometric recess in the stone. Similar outlining traces are sometimes seen around niches as well. This method was used not only for marking the removal of a certain volume of stone along a surface, but also when necessary for dividing a block. It is clearly visible that first a recess was made, and then the excess stone was removed in layers. An example of this can be seen on the already mentioned block at Cerro Capia, in the masonry of Inca Roca at Cusco, and on one of the so-called tired stones at Olentaytambo, where wedge marks represent a later attempt to split off part of the block. It should be noted that the task of removing significant volumes of stone is a key feature of polycurved masonry. Each block had to be shaped in a corresponding bedding joint prepared. It would therefore be logical to expect traces of similar layout in this context as well, where first a recess was made according to the required profile, and then the stone was removed layer by layer, something resembling the markings visible on certain blocks at Sacsayhuaman. However, the unfinished sections of masonry do not show such traces. Only abruptly interrupted edges can be found, which may in fact represent part of the preliminary marking of the block after which a portion of the stone was removed. Another, somewhat more unusual form of this technique is the combination of recesses with holes. Such examples can be seen at Puma Ponku, Kora Kancha, and Machu Picchu. The function of this combination is unknown, and is most often associated with the fastening of ornaments or decorative elements. The holes at Pumapunku and Korakancha differ not only in size, but also in shape. At Pumapunku, the holes have a constant diameter characteristic of drilling, while at Korakancha, as well as at other Peruvian sites, they are conical, typical of chiseling. It can be assumed that the recess connecting the holes on the Pumapunku blocks was not a decorative feature nor a layout mark but part of a process that facilitated the making of the holes, for example, for supplying water. On the unfinished sarcophagus in the Cairo Museum, the layout was made with paint, but where sawing was required, a special groove was cut, apparently also for technical purposes, for supplying water or for collecting metal particles. In that case, the recess connecting the sockets for the T-shaped clamps on the Olente Tambo block may likewise have been intended to hold something during the work. Elongated recesses in stone also had another use, the creation of channels for water systems. These are found in abundance at all polygonal complexes, made both in bedrock and in separate blocks. Here too there was often excess effort. For example, in creating the central part of waterfalls, the end of a channel was made protruding so that the water would fall freely rather than flow directly down the stone. To produce this element, stone was removed from the entire surface of a block, often quite large in size, when it would have been sufficient to shape only a small section, or even to insert a protruding element. Another example is found at the outlet of a ceremonial basin, where the channel was made in the form of a hole, which allowed water to be supplied in measured amounts, regulating, albeit minimally, the flow capacity. On one of the blocks where the channel has a side branch, there is an interesting trace that can be interpreted as an obvious mistake. The measurement was taken along one side of the channel, but the work was started in another direction. When the inaccuracy was discovered, the side channel was shifted slightly to the side. This kind of mistake is strange. With a careful approach, measurements are usually taken several times precisely to avoid such errors. Here, however, it looks as if making the groove posed no difficulty, and the discrepancy was noticed only after a certain amount of work had already been done. When producing drainage channels, in order to ensure proper flow capacity, the grooves were made deeper and wider than those used for marking. It is clear that these traces correspond fully to the elongated traces of working on blocks, which can vary in width and depth. Some of the most well-known examples are found at the rock outcrop of Kenko, and similar ones exist on the backside of the 6 megalith block at Olente Tambo. All of these elongated grooves share one property, their sides are close to parallel. In some cases, this parallelism can be explained by a specific task, such as producing a water channel of a certain size. But in the case of simple block shaping, there would be no sense in keeping the sides at one size or in consistently working the surface in strips. It is even harder to explain why the ridge between adjacent grooves always remained intact. With a percussive method, this also would have required deliberate effort, that is, a conscious attempt to preserve it, while the task was in fact the opposite, 
to remove as much material as possible. In the case of shaping block edges, another feature appears, a clear layering of removal. Such a trace is easy to leave on a soft rock. But how could a thin line be preserved with simple hammering on hard stone? And more importantly, why would one do so? Another fact that often goes unnoticed in reconstructions also requires explanation. The work surfaces have strong cavitation. This contrasts with the appearance of surfaces formed by natural fractures. Consequently, in the process of removal, the rock was breaking off in large pieces. By contrast, with percussive methods, the stone is ground into dust, and the resulting surface, though rough, would not contain such large cavities. Thus, it becomes rather simple to determine whether the stone was worked with hammerstones or not. It is enough to strike a section of the same type of rock with hammerstones of different weights and from different types of stone, and then compare the texture. Of course, one must take into account stone erosion. Therefore, comparisons should be made with those areas that were protected by masonry or soil. At the same time, erosion should have affected the entire worked surface. It is clearly visible that the central parts of the blocks are more roughly finished than the edges. This means the rough surface is not the result of erosion, but of methods that produced such an appearance. The question then arises, how and with what could one strike stone so that instead of a rough texture, the result would be so coarse as if the rock were removed in layers? And while the rounded shape of some grooves can be explained by simple percussive methods, right angles raise further questions. With a rounded hammerstone, which is inevitably the form it takes in use, it is impossible to produce a rectangular groove. For that, sharp stone fragments would have to be used, but that would not be rough shaping. Rather, the deliberate action of a sculptor, which does not match the task of simply giving a megalith a preliminary form. In conclusion, the purpose of elongated grooves on blocks and outcrops could have been different, marking part of the working process, the creation of water channels, or the rough removal of rock. Their function is understandable, but the methods by which they were created still require further study. Thank you for watching. See you next time.